From the workplace to the national security space, our next speaker, Dr. Linton Wells II, has devoted his career to thinking about and working on the interrelationships among technology, intelligence, security, and peace. A graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and a career naval officer, Dr. Wells now serves as a distinguished research professor and transformation chair at the National Defense University. He is also a scuba diver. Please welcome Linton Wells II. Thank you very much. So my topic today is the new diplomacy. Technology, connections, intelligence, and world peace, and other topics to cover in 15 minutes. Uh, in point of fact, though, diplomacy is too narrow a focus. If you listen to policymakers now, they're talking about uh, the combination of diplomacy, defense, and development as the three constituents of something called smart power. So you need to move beyond just diplomacy. In any case, what I'd like to do is address these in terms of the four content pillars here in Brainstorm Tech of uh, renewal and recovery and uh, transformation and uh, the technology and social transformation, the 21st century consumer, and business innovation. What I'd like you to take away is to think about how you can apply smart tools in this context of smart power. So let's see. This is a slide called The Curve of Conflict, put out by the U.S. Institute of Peace. And if you look in the lower left-hand corner, it starts with kind of a stable situation of state building and international systems. And then as, conf as confrontation increases, you get up to conflict prevention and crisis response. So this is things like deterrence, compellence, dissuasion. Finally, out, uh, uh, conflict breaks out, you get peacemaking, and then after the conflict ends, you continue with uh, peacekeeping in the context of sporadic violence and uh, uh, you know, unstable situations. Finally, as tensions decrease, a new set of skill sets are needed, and these are those to move back to post-conflict stabilization and state building. Now, other elements use different characteristics. Department of Defense, for example, has six phases, ranging from phase zero peace up to phase five, post-war return to civilian government. But what's really interesting in this is the role foreseen for U.S. military. Uh, the senior leadership of the Defense Department en envisions that the U.S. future military will be involved in four main functions. And one is combat, <clears throat> one is security, one is engagement with population, <clears throat> and the other is relief and reconstruction. So if you think about that, two and a half, with certain setting the conditions of security, even the other half, actually have much more to do with peace building than they do with conflict. The um, U.S. Institute for Peace uses peace building as kind of an umbrella term, which is, they say, the collective works of governments, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, <clears throat> and civil society in order to prevent, resolve, and recover from conflict. So the question here is, what is the role for business? And I would submit that business has a very large role in this. Also, what about violence at home? Suppose you're dealing with crime. Suppose you're dealing with uh, civil unrest. Is that part of the peace equation? Uh, we spent a fair amount of time looking at this uh, last year in uh, Brainstorm Tech. And we basically defined peace out of that to be the absence of violence, domestic and foreign. My question for you is, do you agree with that? Uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, comments. In any case, it's clear that peace ops, peace operations of some sort, clearly involve multi-sectors. You've got to have business. You've got to have government. You've got to have civil and military government. You need to have civil society. So that's going to involve academia. It's going to involve non-governmental organizations, such as Doctors Without Borders. It's going to involve international organizations like the UN. It's going to involve uh, private volunteer organizations like Rotary, religious groups. In some, just about every one of you out here is a member of one of these groups that can be involved in some means in peace operations. Let's see. Actually, I just want to turn the slide off. That's all right. Uh, so what are the emerging threats to peace? You can consider a much wider range than traditional cross-border conflict. Uh, for example, the effects of climate change, resource imbalances and shortages, 
uh, particularly water, too little, too much, too warm, not pure. Food and energy, economically driven factors, such as um, lack of opportunity for jobs, lack of opportunity to create dignity for yourself and your family. This is incredibly important in those parts of the world where there's a youth bulge. I mean, a large part of the world, the population is under 25. How are we going to find them the jobs they need going forward? Uh, one of the things that's concerning NATO very much is the question about transnational migrations, uh, essentially coming out of the imbalance in economic opportunities. You've also got the problem of empowered individuals and small groups. Our distinguished colleague, uh, John Henry Clippinger, has uh, prepared a set of curves. So envision uh, an x-axis that's sort of from about 1,700 to 2,100, and the y-axis is some sort of uh, amount. The first curve is population, which is sort of going like this, and maybe it's going to go that way, or maybe it's going to go this way, but nonetheless, it's increasing. The second curve has to do with connectedness, right? and so clearly we've been talking a lot about the extent to which we're connected. The third curve is lethality per individual, and guess what? That's going the same way. So we have three curves of significantly increasing you know, trends that are not amenable to uh, sort of the traditional means of statecraft. So let's assume that you have two million people in Seattle. And let's say 1% of those are technological geniuses. All right, that's uh, 20,000 technological geniuses in Seattle. Let's say 1% of, of those are raving sociopaths. You've got 200 raving sociopaths in one American city connected to the internet and capable of uh, producing reasonable amounts of lethality with um, uh, you know, bio uh, hazards they can cook up in their basement uh, breweries. How do we empower citizens to understand this? Because there's no way that the forces of government are going to get far enough down into our societies to understand this. And finally, as far as uh, threats, you've got cyber. Uh, we've gone from a network-enabled society to a network-dependent society. This truly is a critical infrastructure. How do we, in fact, teach our kids about responsible behavior online, about the dangers online, when the government is talking in terms of terms like cyber this and cyber that, and most of the young people you talk to don't use the term? So how can tech help in all this? Uh, one is well, recognizing that technology is not an end in itself, but an enabler. We have six great parallel revolutions going on in our world today. You've got information technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology. You've got robotics, the search for alternative energy, and sociocognitive. So info, bio, robo, nano, hydro, cogno. Really you know, enormous amounts of opportunities. But there are also some other important technologies important to peace. Water, sanitation, as we heard about yesterday, public health non-lethal technologies for crowd control, things like that, surveillance for maintaining uh, issues over borders. The point again, almost every one of you from any discipline you have in this room is capable of engaging in something and making a contribution to peace. There is a common need for all of these stages, and that need is to share information between the civil and military participants in these sorts of missions. If you cannot communicate, collaborate, translate, or engage with the local population and the people who are working with you, you cannot achieve the social, the political, and the economic goals for which the military blood and treasure is committed. This cannot be a nice-to-have adjunct to the kinetic phase of warfare. It has to be a core part of the planning from the beginning. So all of those you are involved in the information industry with the Defense Department, this business about unclassified information sharing has got to be a more important piece than it has been in the past. In addition, those of you who are involved in information security, things on cross-domain solutions, that these people work together and maintain a balance between the mission and security is something of growing importance. I have the privilege of being associated with a broad transnational research project called TIDES, uh, which essentially is looking at uh, sustainable support to stressed populations. One of the things this has taught us is that capabilities alone are not enough. You've got to also look at social network development and how you build trust, particularly focusing on local populations, local coalitions of business, government, civil society in their, air, in their worlds, sustainable by them. You've got to focus on taking high-level policy and converting it into field operating procedures so people know what they're doing. You've got to be able to uh, understand the legal and regulatory issues. Is something export controlled? Can you get it through customs? With regard to resources, if the average stay in a refugee camp is more than seven years, which it is, 
That's a completely different problem than the first 60 days after the uh, terrorist incident or the earthquake. So how do you tie all this together and put it in an exercise and a training and education program so we don't keep having lesson observed and next year lesson reobserved and next year lesson reobserved so that uh, uh, we never make progress? I wanted to use this slide because I really wanted to have a quiz at the end of this uh, talk. The point is this just illustrates kind of the same thing I was mentioning before. And look on the left-hand red column, that's about capabilities. So okay, fine, you go out and inventory what's out there and you improve what's there and you help to implement it. And if you're looking at the seven infrastructures, uh, water, shelter, power, sanitation, again, lots of engineers can help with this. Civil engineers, sanitation engineers, water engineers. You got it on next on knowledge sharing and collaboration and ID management. How do you make sense out of all this uh, in perhaps very constrained, restricted bandwidth environments? But that's just not enough. So over in the next column, the social network development and the trust building. The reason why that fourth box down is and highlighted is it's all about the local coalition of business, government, civil society, and how we do something for them in their worlds. Uh, policy, doctrine, legal, and regulatory. The reason why this slide is so complicated is that er some operation somewhere has failed because somebody failed to you know, do well in one of those boxes. It's not a nice to have hypothetical chart. It's trying to implement or illustrate some of the things that have to be done in these environments in order to make them work. So let me challenge you with three thoughts. First of all, transparency improved government, governance. There are those who will say you can't oppress people who can communicate. So the question is, is that really true? Suppose you get authoritarian regimes who can effectively use the new media to propagandize and mobilize mass audience more effectively than they do now. And this actually is a possible spin-off from the focus on the 21st century consumer, on m-commerce. So what do you think about that, and how can we factor that into our planning? Thought two, the new media brings both new challenges and new opportunities. Uh, one of them is that they impose the need on governments to respond in heretofore impossible timelines. Nick Gowing, who is a very distinguished correspondent for the uh, BBC, postulates the governments have max between about three to four hours to respond to Mumbai or a 9-11 or a uh, uh, tsunami before they're overtaken by the, uh, the population's demand for information. The problem is that those who blog and tweet and, and uh, post don't have to be right. The government, by and large, has to be right, at least can't be terribly wrong, and that's imposing just an impossible solution or demand on it right now. On the other hand, the new media can engage young people in ways we've never done before, and in this world of the youth bowls around, uh, around the Islamic and Af African world, that can be terribly important. How many of you are looking at education systems over cell phones that can reach out to villages, Pashto and Dari and Quechua and Yoruba? How many people are getting their gamers to write Sim Village for the kids out there in the, uh, who don't have access to brick and mortar schools? And the Southeast Asia one says, hey kids, if the water goes out real fast, don't go out in the shallows and look for starfish, get your family to high ground, and if something bad happens, here's where you go for health, uh, food, medical, water, things like that. Thought three is the peace can be good business. Steve Colelia, who's a, an Australian entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, has really done some serious thinking about the peace industry. And he points out how business can play a decisive role in creating global peace. And the problem is there's no clear understanding of the impacts on peace, of peace on markets and costs and things like that. And many of the industries, there are many industries that prosper in peace. Uh, insurance, retail, financial services, tourism, commercial aviation, that will be negatively affected by rising violence. Consider then not just the size of the defense industry, consider the potential size of the peace industry and what it can perhaps do. Invest accordingly. Here within Brainstorm Tech, the uh, MIT last year talked about the Legatum Prize, which is devoted to, uh, to tech-driven for-profit businesses that promote prosperity and help keep people get out of poverty. I mean, there are lots of things that can be done. So let me close with a specific uh, example. Maybe. Okay. 
Uh, Afghanistan, this is an example of how you would take distributed renewable power in the 11,000 remote villages that don't have any now, use it to enable cell phones uh, and other communication, and then help the Afghan people get essential services chosen by them, uh, things like education, governance, agriculture, that might be useful to them in their worlds. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the breakout session. Uh, I just want to leave you then with the idea of business, the media who are here in terms of delivering narrative can contribute enormously to this opportunity. I challenge you to do it and hope to we'll see many of you in the breakout session and the uh, promenade uh, where Bright Simon and uh, David Kirkpatrick and I look forward to engaging you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So, okay, before you head off for the lunch labs, uh, please give us your opinion of this morning's sessions using the SpotMe device. This is very important for us to make this thing better and better. So the lunch labs are where we come together in small groups to tackle social and sort of policy questions. The ones we have this year, peace, public integrity, health, social responsibility, or education. And we, we really had great success with this last year. Uh, they're, they're, each of you have signed up for one. The staff will lead you to the correct room. There's a lunch buffet at each room. So first, find your room, get your lunch, and get ready to be creative. Uh, and then after the lunch labs, we'll reconvene here at 1.45 with an interview with John Donahoe, CEO of eBay. And as Lynn said, I'm moderating one with him on uh, peace and technology. And Bright Simons, who's a very bright Ghanaian entrepreneur, will also be there talking to us. So go to a lunch lab, get something done, and see you back here at 1.45.